Hi, I am Nikos. Anyone who knows me knows that I am a pizzaholic. I love eating pizza, I love smelling it, I love talking about it, theorizing about it. It's the best. So last week I went online and I did some research on my favorite food. And I realized that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew about it. I found a surprising fact about the history of one of the most popular pizzas in the world, which also happens to be my favorite, Pizza Margherita. So how did I do this? As a typical millennial, I first turned to YouTube for answers. After watching some of these videos, I then went online to find some scholarly work on the topic. Karol Hestoski's excellent book on the global history of pizza and Antonio Matozzi's groundbreaking book on the history of the pizzeria in Naples were very helpful, but while reading this and some other books on the history of bread, on the history of the tomato, the history of cheese, one thought kept going over and over and over again in my head. The legend of the origin of Pizza Margherita. Queen Margherita, who from this point onwards I will be calling Margie, along with her husband Umberto, Umbi, arrived together in 1889 in Naples. And then legend has it that they grew tired of the monotony of the French court cuisine and they wanted to try some common air fare. More specifically, they wanted to try pizza. So they summoned one illustrious pizzaiolo, Raffaele Esposito, to make them some pizza. They were served three pizzas, one with lard, cacciogavallo and basil, one with a little fish, and one with tomato sauce, mozzarella and basil, which was then known pizza alla mozzarella which Margie named her favorite. To this day, Pizzeria Brandi displays a thank you note from the head of the table of the royal household, Camillo Galli, dated June 1889. And just outside the pizzeria, there is a little plaque which tells customers that this is the home of Pizza Margherita. A lot of YouTube videos, various websites and blogs demonstrate today's popularity of Pizzeria Brandi as a pizza pilgrimage site for foodies, pizza connoisseurs, and tourists. This legend is fascinating, but what primary sources actually support this story? There must be a primary source of some sort, a newspaper clipping, a court document, a diary of a bystander, something that supports this story. So I went to the first place I usually go for researching journal articles, Google Scholar, and I type in pizza history. And bingo. Conveniently for me, historian Zachary Nowak wrote a comprehensive article on the history of the origin of pizza margherita. I read it and I will try to the best of my ability to summarize it for you. Nowak sets out to do fact-checking on these six aspects of the legend. One, that Margie and Umbi arrived together at the Capodimonte Palace in June 1889. Two, that they grew tired of the monotony of the French court cuisine. Three, that of all the common air fare, they wanted to try pizza specifically. Four, out of all of the pizzaiolos, they summoned Rafael Esposito. Five, Esposito made them three pizzas and one of which Margie chose as her favorite. And six, Margie gave her permission to use her name in a thank you note signed by her chamberlain. One, telegrams by Agencia Stefani, which is the Italian equivalent of Reuters, along with other court documents, indeed confirmed that Margie and Umbi visited 
Naples in 1889. However, the dates on which they arrived don't match with the story because Margie arrived on the 21st of May 1889, whereas Umbi, along with the crown prince, arrived on June 11th. The first part of the legend kind of collapse. Point number two. It is very unlikely that a queen like Margie would want to eat pizza instead of French court cuisine. Nowak states in his article that there is a book by the Italian Academy of Cuisine that even highlights Margie as one of the main proponents of the banquet cuisine of the Savoy House and she was one of the people who made it one of the most celebrated cuisines in Europe. Many dishes were named after her including the pasta margherita, margherita mix, which includes egg yolks, confectioner sugar and lemon juice whipped for half an hour. However, menus for the meals of the Savoy family, and not just their dinners, but their private meals as well, were fully recorded in French until 1908. None of these menus included any of the dishes dedicated to Margie. 3. If the Italian royalty would desire to try pizza, there is no chance that they would entrust a commoner like Esposito to prepare it for them. At the time, there was an association of cholera with the unsanitary conditions of the working classes. So there is no chance that the royal couple would actually want to try this. A famous journalist at the time called Matilda Serrao described pizza as a dense dough that burns but does not cook and it is covered with almost raw tomatoes, with garlic, with oregano, with pepper. These pizzas in many pieces that cost one soldo are entrusted to a boy who walks around to sell them on the street on a movable table and there he stays the whole day with these slices of pizza which freeze in the cold, which turn yellow in the sun, eaten by the flies. Therefore we can see that pizza did not hold the cultural capital that it holds today. Another historian of Italian cuisine, John Dickey, found no mention of this supposed meeting between Esposito and the royal couple in the press of the day, and he therefore doubts that Margie and Umbi would actually would have eaten the pizza. He concludes, however, that if Margie indeed used her royal seal on the thank you note, it made political and human sense, equating it to Princess Diana's shaking hands of AIDS victims. As seen in Antonio Matozzi's book, in 1889, there were over 60 pizzerias in Naples. The reason why pizzeria and brandy survived in the 20th century was likely not just because of the quality of its pizzas, but due to the managerial ability of its owners and more importantly, its strategic location. Matozzi underlines the fact that there were likely many other able and illustrious pizzaioli during those years, but who did not have the fortune to have pizzerias near main streets and that's why their pizzerias didn't survive past the 20th century. Neither Rafael Esposito nor his pizzeria were documented as getting any notable award for their amazing pizzas. Matozzi did not think that the establishment was really the most successful of its time and he argues that the fame attributed to Esposito likely came after 1889 or even after his death. Point number five. There is some disagreement on how many pizzas were served and what kind of pizzas were served to the royal couple, but Nowak states that the proof of how many pizzas were served to the royal couple lies in the thank you note. Point number six, the thank you note. Nowak points out that many late 19th century food producers sent samples to the royal household and requested permission to use the royal seal on their stores and advertisements. Judging from the number of successful applicants whose requests and responses to those requests are preserved in a heavy archival box, permission 
was frequently granted. When Nowak researched the concession of licenses for uses of royal seal, he found only two documents in regards to Esposito's establishment. One earlier request for the seal as a wine merchant, which he sent during Victor Emmanuel's reign and not Umbi's reign, and two, a draft of the response by the court. But there was nothing about Pizza Margherita to Esposito or to any other pizzaiolo for that matter. Indeed, the table services personnel at the Palace of Capodimonte for the Queen's visit in May and June 1889 has Galli at its head. One can see that the handwriting on the note displayed in Pizzeria Brandi and a letter written by Galli found in the Italian state archives are completely different. Nowak points out that between these two letters there are only eight common words. The letter by Galli in the Italian archives uses a fountain pen whereas the one displayed in the thank you note does not. Finally, the official seal is also incorrect as it resembles a little bit more the little seal or the fascist seal. The correct seal at the time was A. Another little detail from the thank you note is that Rafael Esposito was given another surname, Brandi. This was definitely not the case then nor now that a husband would take on his wife's surname. So this extra surname gives us a basis for a reasonable theory that the Branding brothers, during some difficult times in the Great Depression, they were desperate to advertise their pizzeria and they decided to make use of a family myth to their advantage. They somehow found the name of Camillo Galli decided on a plausible date and had a believable but not very accurate copy of the royal seal made in rubber. They used some old paper and a pen with a very elegant script and a forgery was made. Their rather clumsy attempt was obviously passable and the earliest written account of the letter on the wall can be seen in a book written by Paris in 1941. The forgery has been accepted at face value for over 80 years. And that was the story of the Margherita Pizza, a marketing ploy to elevate the status of a lowly dish during difficult times. But still, a small part of me wishes that this was a true story. If you like this video, please press the like button and consider subscribing for some more content on food, history, and more.